Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation. Talk radio for the thinking person, home of borders, language, culture. And here he is, Michael Savage. All right, here we go, the Caucasian Caucus, the day after. All right, so what do you what do you expect me to say about this? I'm glad that uh, Cruz won. Let me say this. Any Republican that wins, I will vote for. Okay, can we set the record straight? Do I like Cruz? No. Did I like Trump more? I still do. Does it really matter who wins in Iowa? Uh, let, me, I, let me ask you a question. Does it matter who wins in Iowa? Well, let's look back. Iowa has not picked a winner in 20 years. Bill Clinton, Reagan, Bush, Carter, McCain, Romney, all lost in Iowa, but won the nomination, and some then won the presidency. So let's not get carried away here. The big news here is that socialism is alive and well in Iowa. Maybe that's true in America. The big story, really, is that Sanders almost beat Hillary, and had they not stolen the vote from Sanders, he probably would have won. Had Google not thrown it for Hillary, Sanders probably would have won which is truly the biggest story of the day. But as you well know, the media won't ever talk about that. And the only thing they're going to talk about is Trump's a loser, Trump's a loser, Trump's a loser. All of the jealous ones are saying Trump's a loser. Let's wait and see what happens in New Hampshire and onward. The big story here is that a socialist nearly won in Iowa. And I think you should stop obsessing about Donald Trump and uh, Celia Cruz. A socialist nearly won in Iowa. I'm not interested in Celia Cruz and Donald Trump right now. In fact, if Sanders was not as disgusting as he is physically and not as unappealing, his politics would have won in Iowa. It's just that they look at the guy and they can't, they can't even, they hold their nose and they still can't vote for him. Now, the fact of the matter is, I'm going to talk about socialism in the farmland. Do you know about agrarian socialism. Does anyone remember the words agrarian socialism from high school? I have a very keen memory, and I remember reading about agrarian socialism in the Oklahoma uh, uh, countryside way back when, then in the Iowa countryside. There's always been a strong agrarian socialist movement in the farmlands. Did you know that? Now, what does it have to do with Iowa? Well, it has a lot to do with it. In fact, somebody wrote a great article entitled Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus in the Oklahoma Countryside, 1904 to 1920. And I know we're talking about Iowa, not Oklahoma, but it applies. Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus were actually being argued over yesterday in Iowa. People, some of them knew it was about Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus competing for the vote. Most didn't know that it was Marx, Jefferson, and Jesus who were being uh, actually fought over in yesterday's election. When you say Karl Marx, you know it's Bernie Sanders. When you say Jesus, you know it was Ted Cruz. And when you say Jefferson, it was more Trump. Actually, if you just break it down that way, it was like that. Now, there's another element to this that you uh, should, should understand. This is primarily a Democrat state, Iowa. Since 1988, they voted for a Republican candidate just once, G- once G.W. Bush in 04. It is primarily a Democrat left-leaning state. That's the fact of reality. 04, they voted for Bush. 08, they voted for Obama. 2012, they voted for Obama. So, you know, what do you expect? It's a left-leaning state. They like Bernie Sanders, and they like uh, Ted Cruz. Now, how do you define yourself politically? I want you to try to think instead of being a middle school-level knee-jerk conservative, which has very little meaning today. Oh, I'm a conservative. What does that mean? What does that word mean? Now, you immediately say, Constitution. Fine. We got that already. How many years do I have to hear the same word till we all get it? What, are you the only one who read the Constitution? I read it in the fifth grade. We understand it. Stop beating us up about it already. Everyone trusts the Constitution who is a conservative or a Republican. But you need to go beyond that. Try to think instead of being a middle school level knee-jerk conservative. We've heard the words knee-jerk liberal, knee-jerk liberal, and you laugh at them. 
But what is a knee-jerk conservative? Probably most of talk radio's listeners define themselves as so. How do you define yourself politically? Are you a values voter, a party activist, a feminist? Are you politically correct, a libertarian? Are you disaffected, gun, th gun enthusiast? Uh, would you say you're a cynic, a centrist, an isolationist? How about this? Would you be, in your mind, a capitalist, a socialist? Would you say you're devoutly religious? Would you say you're neoconservative? Would you say you're an optimist? Would you say you're a true believer? Would you say you're an anti-Wall Streeter? Would you say you're politically incorrect? Think about what I just said to you. These are words that are not used in talk radio today. We're down to two words, conservative and communist. Conservative and socialist. Socialist, conservative. I can't do it. So let's try to open up the conversation to something a, li a little broader. A lot of other things out there to talk about other than two words. And I think the most interesting to me is the agrarian socialist strain in Iowa. I remember reading about it in high school. It came back to me this morning as I was analyzing the Caucasian caucus. Someone asked me last night, what did you think of the vote when Cruz beat Trump? I said, I don't think it's representative of America. He said, you're right, that's all. Period, end of story. That doesn't mean Cruz is not going to go on to winning May. And I'll lay it out again so you finally get it right. If he's the candidate, I will work. Uh, I will vote for him. I think he's a terrible choice to be the candidate for one reason, because he's a maniac when it comes to attacking Putin. He's a thousand percent wrong on hating Putin. Where he gets this from is very clear to me. He's an old Reaganite. He still thinks the Cold War is alive and well as it was in the 1950s. He still thinks ICBMs are aimed at each other and that the uh, Iron Curtain hasn't fallen down. He still has the image of Khrushchev banging a shoe on a table. Someone fed that to his brain. Why do they hate Russia and Putin? Ask yourself about these great constitutionalists. Why they have such a vendetta against Putin, who's our natural ally against radical Islam. That's the one danger about this Ted Cruz. Who is advising him on this? I don't know. I can only imagine it's some old, failed Reaganites waiting for Confederate money to be spent, uh, spread out again. You know, save your Reagan dollars, uh, the South will rise again. Now, I know you want to talk. I know you don't want me to talk, but I'll keep talking for a while. And the phone number here, if you want to talk, is 855-407-282. Grab a line, that's all. Now, Carson is claiming Cruz ground forces planted a dropout story to win in Iowa. Okay, night of dirty tricks, says Fox News. Ben Carson claims the uh, workers for Cruz ran around saying that Carson was dropping out. And today, I think, isn't it true, Robert, that Cruz acknowledged he did it? He said he had no, really didn't know what was going on. His people did it without his, right? So a lot of those people voted for him. Now, here's something you don't want to hear. But as an expert in statistics, I have to say something that's a little worrisome, by the way. Now, you know the Cruz won in the Republican primaries and that Donald came in second and that Rubio came in third. We all know that. But no one's reading the statistics right. As someone who is trained to read data correctly in my epidemiological statistical analysis, I had to read data every which way to Sunday, up, down, sideways, forwards, backwards, to study disease patterns. And here's how I analyze it. Tell me if you agree with me because you're not going to want to hear it, but you'll hear it first in the Savage Nation and perhaps uh, you'll learn something from it. Okay, so we know who won. We met about 8,000 people voted more than voted for, uh, for Cruz than voted for Trump. But if I remember correctly, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, 23,000 voted for uh, Rubio. What would have happened if it was a two-way race, if it was only Trump versus Cruz? Cruz would have won three to, two to three to one. Do you know that? Do you, do you understand what I just said to you? The real story here is that Donald was very weak in, uh, in Iowa, very much weaker than you may think. You could say, well, you know, Rubio split the vote, and if it wasn't for Rubio, Trump would have surged. I don't think so. I think if Rubio wasn't in there, Tr uh, Cruz would have gotten m m m most of those votes from Rubio. That's my opinion. And, and that's very worrisome for those of you who think this is going to play out the same way in other states. But it's not going to play out the same way in other states. Uh, Iowa is, as a, is an anomaly. It's known as an outlying a statistic. It's not America. So you can keep focusing on it all you want. 
And for those of you who love one candidate over another, you can make more of it than you want. And those of you who lost, you can make less of it if you want. And, and both positions are not invalid. But one is more valid than, other, than the other, in plain English. Because Iowa is an anomaly. Iowa is not America. I keep saying to you, uh, <coughs> Iowa is primarily an agrarian socialist state. It has a history of agrarian socialism. The Socialist Party was very big in that state in the last century, in the early parts of the century. Farmers have always distrusted Wall Street. Did you know that? Okay. Wall Street, yeah. You say, well, that's a dirty word. That's a code word, by the way, for something other than um, a category of, um, of work. When you say Wall Street, you're really saying something about an ethnicity rather than a job category. But I won't go into that now because it's too easy. Oh, I hate bankers. Another code word. Banker is a code word, a polite word for something else as well. You know, but before we get off that topic, I really feel it's necessary as someone who understands big business uh, more so than you may understand. You have to understand that banks, investment banks like Goldman Sachs and hedge funds actually run America. Whether you like it or not, it's hedge funds and Goldman Sachs that are running America, for better or for worse. I mean, you may as well get used to it instead of sitting there complaining thinking that it's 1970. It's not 1970. Is this what I want? Well, I see nothing wrong with investment banks. I don't know what's wrong with it. I don't know. People say, oh, banks. What, do you want to conduct a business deal in the billions of dollars? You can do it. You're smart enough to do it. You're not smart enough to do it. These people are geniuses in the investment bank world. Don't underestimate them. They're the ones who keep the machinery turning that keeps America's corporations alive by the way you want a massive depression then get rid of all the investment banks and get rid of all the hedge funds you'll have a nice a nice meltdown you'll have the dust bowl again that's all i mean many of you don't live in the modern world the, the current world excuse me you're living in the past you have to live with what is now in my old book trickle up poverty i talked about what's wrong with some of the activities of some of these institutions and i don't want to repeat it and sound academic and redundant but in, in the Trickle of Poverty, which was a runaway bestseller, way ahead of its time, often quoted, I talked about banks, believe it or not. And I, I have to find the exact statement so I'm not misquoting my, myself. And I believe it was here about the uptick rule. And I can't really put my fingers on it. Here it is. Reinstate the Wall Street uptick rule. And I talk about what that means, short selling, the uptick rule, which was eliminated by the SEC under uh, Bush, I believe. Yeah, oh, yeah, Bush did that one. There was another one that was very important. Glass-Steagall, I was the first to talk about in that book. I know many people talk about it today, but the Glass-Steagall Act was eliminated, I believe, under Bill Clinton by the fly fisherman who he handpicked and put into the Treasury Department to eliminate uh, the uh, Glass-Steagall Act so they can basically uh, take risks without taking risks. So, you know, in terms of wild speculation, there needs to be some kind of constraint imposed. But let's not throw the entire institution out the window, is what I'm saying to you. You can say what you want. Banks are this, banks are that, and uh, you know, hedge funds are that. They're here to stay. There needs to be some constraints rather than destruction of these institutions. And secondly, no matter what you think, it's not, they're not going to be eliminated just because you don't like it. They're going to listen to you. Who do you think picks the candidates? Who do you think picked Rubio, this unknown nobody, to even run? The, the dark horse who's probably going to be elected because he's wanted by the establishment. Well, who is the establishment? The hedge funds and the investment banks. Back in a minute. It's like the day after a snowstorm. You want to talk about the slush that we're looking at today? Go ahead. 855-400-7282. Let's analyze the slush in the street. And we'll talk about Sanders is the big winner and that the, the agrarian socialism of Iowa is not dead, that a socialist nearly, nearly won the uh, Democrat side and he's not finished, and that uh, Trump, who came in second, uh, was very lucky that there was a third guy named Rubio or Cruz would have beaten them two or three to one. By my estimation, the Rubio voters would have gone with, with uh, whatever his 